Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I am the pastor of the Spring Church here in Lawrence, South Carolina. And I come out here today with my friend John, my friend Travis, to preach to you the gospel of grace, to bring to you the good tidings of salvation, the good news of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to exalt my King. The, the preaching of the gospel in the open air is, is an act of worship to God. It's an act of, of reverential praise to God. And friends, we want to worship God through this means today, this morning. And friends, we come out here out of a care for your soul, out of a care for where you're going to go when you die. For as Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 9, that it is appointed for a man once to die, and after this comes the judgment. Friends, there's coming a day when God will hold you accountable for what you have done. If you are outside of Christ, God will judge you for your sins. And we certainly do not want that for you. We do not desire that you would perish in your sins, that you would be lost, that your soul would be damned eternally. Instead, it is our heart's desire and our prayer that you would, would find righteousness in Christ. You would find perfect righteousness in the Son of God. That, that in Christ you would have eternal life. That you would repent and believe that Jesus Christ died to save His people from their sins, as Matthew 1 tells us. And as Romans 4 says, He rose again for our justification. Friends, it is our desire that you would believe that, that the Spirit of God would, would raise you to spiritual life, would give you the gift of faith in the Gospel. For no one can believe unless it has been given to Him from on high. Jesus Himself said in John chapter 3 that the Spirit of God is, is a free agent and He is free to do as He pleases. And so it is, our, it is our heart's desire that you would be saved, that you'd be reconciled to God, but we do know full and well, we know that God is the sovereign agent and that God will save all those whom He sets out to save and all those for whom Christ died and all those that the Father elected. And so, therefore, we know that God's sovereign decree will come to pass surely. And so, friends, it is also our strong exhortation to you that in light of the sovereignty of God, in light of the glory of God as it is revealed in the Gospel, in light of the beauty of God's holiness, it is our call to you this morning to give glory to God. In so doing that you would repent of your sin, that you would flee your rebellion, and you'd believe upon the Son of God. It is our prayer that you would embrace Christ, that you would embrace His claims, that you would believe the Word of the Gospel. The Gospel is a promise from on high. It is a promise from the Most High that all who come unto Christ will be pardoned and all of them shall be saved. Not one of them shall be lost. Not one of them shall ever be lost. And it is all by the free grace of God so that God gets the glory. God is jealous for His glory. Isaiah 48 tells us that God is jealous for His glory and He will not share it with another. He will not give His glory to another. And so that is why it is our strong exhortation to you that you would give God the glory for who He is and for what He has done in His Son the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is my desire to point you to a specific passage of Scripture this morning. The text that I would like to consider as our main text for this sermon. And the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is out of Romans chapter 3. In Romans 3, Beginning in verse 5, the Apostle Paul is writing here, and he's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He writes these words. He says, But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is He? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? Now, the issue that Paul is dealing with here in these two verses, in verses 5 and 6 of Romans 3, 
is the issue of God's inflicting wrath upon the wicked. God bringing judgment upon the head of the wicked, of the evildoer. Is God just in doing so? Is God righteous in doing so? And the answer that is inferred in the text, the answer that is clearly put forth and propounded by Paul is yes, God is completely just in, in punishing the wicked. In no way is He unjust. No way is He unrighteous. God, when He punishes the wicked, is just in doing so. That's why the book of Genesis describes Him as the just judge of the earth. Friends, let us not think that God is, is unrighteous or unfair in sending the sinner to hell for their sins. My friends, sin is worse than we can possibly fathom. It's evils. The, the depths of its evils cannot be found. No plumb line can sound its depth. Sin is a, a grievous evil, a, a, a perverted thing. It is that which is in contradiction to the character of God. That which is in contradiction to the, the perfection of God's holiness. And so sin in its nature is filthy. And that's why we want you to be saved from it. Because both in its effects and its power, it destroys souls. And its effects, what I mean by that is that it brings the soul to hell. Sin will damn your soul, friends. Sin will cause you to be lost eternally. And sin also in its, in its power over you, even in this life, will bring you much pain in this very life. So sin both ruins the life which is here and the life which is to come. And that is where the Bible places most of its emphasis when warning concerning sin. That it's, it's damaging to the life which is to come. For if you live a life of sin and you are not in Christ, then the life which is to come will not be any life for you. Eternity will not be an eternity of life. It will be an eternity of death. Of being lost in hell forever in your sins. But many people bring the objection before the tribunal of God and say, How can you, O God, punish a soul in hell forever? How can you send the soul to hell for sin which they committed an infinite, a finite amount of times? How can you send them to a place of infinite torment for only sin which is finite? How can God still be just in doing so? It is because of the nature of God's character. See, my friends, when we think about sin, we need to allow that to take us back to the character of God. Because sin contradicts the character of God. And so, who is God? Well, God is infinite in being and in perfection. And so, when we offend God, we, we bring upon ourselves an infinite offense. An infinite amount of guilt because we've offended an infinitely holy God. And so therefore it is only just and it is only fit that the punishment for sin is infinite. In fact, that's one of the worst aspects of hell is that it continues on and on. And the torments of those who are found there shall never end. That their soul will have no rest both day or night. But God will bring justice upon the wicked. And let us not think that hell is a place where Satan is carrying a pitchfork and poking people in the back for sinning against God. My friends, God is there punishing the wicked. God is, is administering the judgment upon the ungodly. And let us not ever be so proud as to think that God in doing so is unjust. He is perfect in His judgments. In fact, uh, Psalm 119, 137, the psalmist writes, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Every one of them is perfect. There's not one that is wrong. And let us never think that God would be unfair. 
For God is impartial no matter who He deals with, the rich or the poor, the famous or the not so famous, the high in society and the lowly. God deals with all fairly and justly. So friends, let us never think that God is unjust in bringing judgment upon the wicked. But the good news of the gospel is that even though we have this, this judgment that is upon us, even though we deserve the infinite wrath of God to be poured out on us for all eternity, Christ, the infinite God-man, the, the Holy One of Israel, the eternal God, came and lived and died upon the cross and bore the wrath of God. See, only Christ could pay for an infinite sentence. Only Christ in those few hours on that cross some 2,000 years ago could completely drain the wrath of God, the, the full reservoir of holy indignation against the wicked. Every ounce was drained out by the Son of God upon the cross. And that's why it is damnable to believe that Jesus is inferior to the Father, that in some way He does not possess the being of God, that He is in some way not God, as perhaps the Jehovah's Witnesses would tell you. Christ is the Almighty. Jesus Himself said in John 8.58, He said, Before Abraham was born, I am Ego eimi, which is derived from the Old Testament. He, he's drawing off of Exodus 3, where God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Jesus is saying there in John 8 that I am the one who appeared to Moses. And we know from the, the record in Exodus that the one who appeared to Moses was Yahweh. Jesus is Almighty God. And He drained the wrath, the infinite wrath. He satisfied the infinite wrath of the Father against sin. So that God could pardon the wicked. And that's the essence of the Gospel message. That God sent His Son into the world to redeem lost souls. And so it is our cry, it is our plea that you would flee to Christ for eternal life. So it is ultimately these truths concerning the justice of God in punishing the wicked and ultimately letting that lead us to the Gospel. These truths are what I want to consider this morning as we look at this text and others. Before we do that, I'd like to consider the context of what Paul is saying here in Romans 3, where Paul has come from and where he's ultimately going. He has just brought to a close Romans chapter 2, which called out the religious in Paul's day. Paul was, was boldly calling out the religious uh, people who were prideful and thought that they needed not salvation, as the filthy pagans did. But Paul calls him out and says, no, you're in great need of salvation, just as the, the, the non-religious person is. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which he later writes in chapter 3, the chapter we are in this morning. And the, the immediate context of who Paul was dealing with in Romans 2 were the Jewish people who had rejected Christ but still had the outward trappings of religion. And so Paul then addresses an anticipated objection that probably would have been brought up in, chap in, in verse 1 of chapter 3 when he says, Then what advantage has the Jew or what is the benefit of circumcision? In other words, Okay, these Jewish people, they don't have salvation in Christ, but what benefit do they have? Well, he says in verse 2, Great in every respect, for first of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. My friends, it is a bad thing to be a churchgoer who is lost. It is a terrifying thing to be someone who is in church and who is self-deceived and deluded. However, there is benefit to that because you do have some knowledge some inklings, some nuggets of truth. And it should have been on account of those pieces of truth 
that you sought the Lord and that you believed upon Christ for salvation. And so he says in verse 3, What then if some did not believe? Their unbelief will not nullify the, uh, the faithfulness of God, will it? And then he says in verse 4, May it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be judged in your words, and excuse me, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. My friends, just because the Jewish people, have, for the most part, were unfaithful, or perhaps many churchgoers who appear in churches in this very county are unfaithful and lost, that does not nullify the, the faithfulness of God. That does not nullify the sovereign decree of God to keep a people unto Himself and to redeem His elect by His grace and for His glory. And so therefore that leads us right to the beginning of verse 5. And so let us consider the justice of God in inflicting wrath. Paul begins in verse 5. He says, If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Now what he's saying here is this. is Okay, if we've sinned against God and therefore we deserve the punishment of God against us in our sin and God manifests His judgment against us, what are we going to say to that? He continues in verse 5. The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is He? So what he is saying is, by our sin, we earn the judgment of God and God judges us. Is God unrighteous in doing that? Is God unholy in bringing upon the wicked judgment? Paul says at the end of verse 5, I'm speaking in human terms. And then in verse 6 he says, May it never be. My friends, God is perfect in His dealings. We must grasp this. Many people try and soften the doctrine of hell and try and soften the doctrines concerning God's judgment against the wicked. They try to conceal that truth because it, it, it makes them fearful or makes them uncomfortable. My friends, we need not cower back from this blessed reality. God is just in His dealings with the children of men. In no way does God do anything faulty or wrong. We need not bring complaints before God concerning His justice, or else we will be met with the divine response that Paul gave later on in Romans to those who question the sovereignty of God. In verse 20, he says in Romans 9, on the contrary, who are you, O man, to an who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Or does, the pot does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And He did so to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, which He prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom He also called. Oh, my friends, here Paul presents the justice of God. In dealing with the children of men, do not be so prideful as to think so little of God. And do not offend God by thinking so little of Him in that manner. Friends, I have spoken much on the judgment of God and it is my plea that you would flee to Christ, that you would fear the Lord. It is a healthy thing to fear God. It is a good thing to fear God. Scripture in both Old and New Testaments puts that forward that we are to fear God. We are to fear the Lord. And that ought to be one of the things that presses and pushes us to cry out to Christ for mercy, to call upon the name of the Lord. Acts 2.20 says, for, all, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved from their sins.
Going back to verse 6 there, as I said earlier, Paul says, may it never be, and then he says, for otherwise, how will God judge the world? In other words, if God is unjust in his judgment, then how will he judge the world? Because it's assumed here in the text that God will judge the world. Paul assumes that, and it's a true reality. We know that from elsewhere in Scripture that God is going to judge the wicked. He's going to judge all the wicked. And so if Paul is presenting this plausible idea, if God is unjust, how is He going to judge the world? And of course the answer back to that is, well, God is not unjust. He is absolutely just in all His ways. That's one of the glorious attributes of God. Another attribute of God is that God is filled with grace toward His people. He is gracious and abounding in loving kindness toward His church, toward His redeemed. In fact, even there's a generic sense in which God shows kindness and grace and a love toward the wicked. We find that even on a beautiful day like this, an October day, here in South Carolina, this speaks to the grace of God and the mercy of God in holding back from us what we deserve, which is hell. God is the sovereign Lord who reigns over the universe. As I said earlier, God's hand cannot be stayed. It cannot be resisted. God is reigning and ruling and working all things after the counsel of His will, as Ephesians 1 tells us. And so therefore, no man can stand before the Lord and resist His sovereign decree. It would be as if someone attempted to quench the, the sun using a water gun. It wouldn't work, my friends. And it would be a foolish endeavor to take upon oneself. So it is with the one who tries to resist the sovereign decree of God. The sovereign rule of the Lord Jesus Christ spans the entirety of the universe. There's not a maverick molecule. There's not a maverick atom in this world, in this universe. There are some in churches who believe that God only knows what happens in the future. That is a lie. God not only knows what is going to happen in the future, He's decreed it. He has decreed what's going to come to pass, friends. See, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the character of God. God is the active, sovereign agent in all events that come about. God uses secondary causes, for He Himself is the ultimate first cause. But even in that sovereignty, He shows grace. Abundance of grace toward the wicked. But that never is to be taken as something which we can trample underfoot. That we can take and say, well, God is gracious, so I can do whatever I want. God's grace was never for that purpose. It was never for that. In fact, as Romans chapter 4 tells us, or excuse me, Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, the kindness of God is to lead you to repentance. Friends, the kindness of God, the grace of God are not things which are there for you to say, wow, God is this way, so I'm just going to act however I want. It is there for us to say, wow, I deserve to be thrown into hell, yet God shows me mercy, yet God shows me grace, and therefore in light of that, I'm going to obey Him because I'm grateful. It's like if, for example, someone came up to you and gave you $3 million in cash, you would sense a great burden of being in debt to that person, a great, a great gratitude toward them, and you would, you would almost do whatever they asked you because you're so grateful. How much more when God grants the wicked favor? When God causes the sun to rise on the unrighteous and the righteous alike? When God brings rain upon the crops of both the wicked and the holy? That's why in Exodus 34, verse 6, 
God Himself is speaking here and He says, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Verse 7, Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. My friends, God's grace is never to the negation of His holiness, never to the negation of His justice. They do not cancel out one another. They do not stand in opposition toward one another. They are not polar opposites. They are in beautiful harmony and agreement with one another. God is holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. My friends, God in His, in His being is perfect. In fact, even the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, His, His name is beginning with that first word, holy. Christ is described in the, in the Gospels as the Holy One of Israel. The Father is also in the Old Testament ascribed with that title as the Holy One of Israel. God is three times thricefold holy. That is why Scripture says He dwells in unapproachable light. Let no man think that in his sin and in his filth he can approach the Lord. In fact, Isaiah the prophet had the, one, of the, one of the greatest privileges given to him. He was able to have a vision of God in heaven. He appeared before the Lord in glory. And he records here in Isaiah 6 that when he saw the Lord on His throne in glory, that He said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. My friends, Isaiah was one of the most holy men in his day. Yet, he cries out in, in anguish of soul that he is a sinner before the perfection of God. Before the holiness of God. Let no man be so prideful as to think that He can stand before the Lord and not be in terror, not be with a great fear. And so, my friends, God, as a, as a manifestation of His holiness and a manifestation of His perfect character, God did something. God gave His law. God gave His Ten Commandments, as I'm sure you who have grown up in church or who have perhaps visited churches before, maybe are familiar with the Ten Commandments that God gave are there for a specific purpose. God's law is not just this arbitrary set of rules God came up with. These are specific commands God gave for a specific purpose. And God's law is there to show us two things. Two things primarily. Firstly, God's law shows us His holy character. God's law shows us His character. As we consider the commands... We see the character of God unfolded. That's why in, in Mark 10, Jesus says in verse 19, He said to the rich young ruler, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. My friends, these commands were given by God as a manifestation of His perfect character, of His holy character. Uh, the first one Jesus says there, do not murder. Why would God say that? God is not a murderous God. Do not commit adultery. Why does God desire that spouses be faithful to one another? Because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. His promises do not ever fail. Do not ever fail. God's Word is settled in heaven. His promises shall not be thwarted from coming to pass. Do not steal. God owns all things and therefore He has the divine prerogative and the right to tell us what we ought to do with that which He has given us. Do not bear false witness. Do not lie. God gave that command because He Himself is not a liar. Because as the book of Hebrews tells us, it is impossible for God to lie. It is an impossibility for God to bear false witness. Everything He says is true, for He Himself is truth. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Do 
God's holy law shows us his character. And then secondly, the second purpose or the or a second function of the law of God is to then show us our character in light of of the character of God to show us our sinful unrighteous character for we consider those same commands that are given there in Mark chapter 10 verse 19 where Jesus says do not murder and you may say well listen I've never murdered otherwise I'd be in prison however Jesus came along in in the previous book in Matthew chapter 5 and Jesus said he acquainted anger within one's heart unjustified hatred in one's heart to murder. God sees you if you have hatred, you have anger that's unjustified in your heart towards someone else. God sees you as a murderer because He sees the thoughts. He sees the mind, my friends. And God sees that the heart is evil. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. Do not commit adultery. You may then say again, listen, I've never been unfaithful to my spouse. Jesus, however, said in Luke, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said if you look at someone with lust, if you look at someone with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. God looks at you as if you had already committed the act of adultery. My friends, God's standards are so high because He in His character is perfect. Do not steal. Have you ever stolen something? Thieves will have their place in hell, my friends. Thieves will be damned to hell. Flee to Christ. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Don't die in your sins. Instead, have righteousness given to you as a gift. By the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ. He has earned righteousness on behalf of His people. And righteousness is given to those who repent and believe Him. Do not bear false witness. Are you a liar? Have you ever lied in your life? Then God sees you as a liar in your sin. He sees you as someone who has borne false witness. So therefore we find ourselves as transgressors, as lawbreakers, having broken the law of God. Having acted in contradiction to the perfect character of God. Again, that is what sin is. It is against and it is in contradiction to the perfect character of God. That's why Paul could write in this same chapter in Romans 3, in verse 23, he said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, no one is exempt from sin. In fact, 1 John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You're deluded if you think you don't have sin in yourself. You're self-deceived if you think not that you are a wicked, vile wretch. I myself know that I am a wicked sinner lost apart from the grace of God. All people are. Paul described in Ephesians 2.1 as being dead in sin, being dead in trespasses and sin. And so therefore we are condemned to hell. The, ju the judgment of God against the wicked is what? It is hell. It is the place that Jesus spoke on more than He did about heaven. He spoke more about hell than He did about heaven because He wanted, wanted to warn sinners about the impending judgment of hell. About the impending wrath of God. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of outer darkness. The place of eternal punishment, never-ending torment. The place where God's wrath is administered upon the wicked. The place of an unquenchable flame where the worm does not die. Friends, hell is horrible. I don't want you to go there in your sins. Jesus described hell very vividly in Mark 9. He says in Mark 9, 42, 
or excuse me, in verse 43, he says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. We are all under such a judgment. And that is why Christ came to redeem those who otherwise would be lost eternally, would be crushed under the weight of the wrath of God. He came to die for those sinners who deserved divine wrath against them. Very brief, briefly though, I'd like to consider something that is very important that we understand. Something that is upon our many of our minds and hearts for it happened just this Sunday night and that is the shooting in Las Vegas the shooting in Las Vegas that happened just in these recent days we ask ourselves where was God in such event, an event what did what role did the Lord of hosts play in such an event I say it is a role of intimacy for God ordained such an event to come to pass but let us not think that those who suffered the fate at that concert, those many souls, those many people who died from those gunshot wounds were worse sinners than ourselves. For unless we repent, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus addressed this very issue in His day. Jesus says in Luke 13 verse 4, Jesus says, do you suppose, He's speaking to the unbelieving Jews, He says, do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed, killed them, were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? So what Jesus is saying is this, in Jesus' day apparently there had been a disaster where a tower in Siloam, which was a, a subsection of Jerusalem, had fallen and killed 18 people. So it was this horrific freak accident. And Jesus brings this forward here in that verse and says, do you suppose that those 18 people are worse culprits, in other words, worse sinners than all the men who live in Jerusalem. And listen to the divine response. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Friends, those people who died at that concert in Las Vegas in such a horrific fashion are not worse sinners than you or me. They're not worse people because they suffered such a, faint, a fate. No, but unless you repent, you will also suffer a worse fate than they. You will be crushed eternally under the weight of the wrath of God. That's the divine lesson in light of tragedy, in light of divine, uh, excuse me, in light of freak accidents and other things that happen to, of that nature, is that we not, need not be prideful. And think, wow, those people must have been great sinners for God to bring about such a horrible death. No. For unless you repent, you will perish. So therefore, we are all condemned to hell on an equal plane there, simply awaiting the judgment of God. However, my friends, I have great news. I have great news that the, the story does not end there. The truth does not end at that spot. Oh no, my friends. But here we find the gospel of grace waiting for us. Waiting for us to behold its beauty and glory. In light of the bad news, in light of this horrible news that we all deserve hell for our sins we find the Gospel that Jesus Christ saved sinners. That Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That the Father sent His Son into the world to redeem the elect, to redeem the church. Jesus came to die for His bride. As Ephesians 5.25 says, Paul tells the men in Ephesus, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. Oh my friends, the love that God has manifested in the Gospel is manifestly evident. It is clearly evident before our eyes. The grace that God has revealed in His Son, 
to send him into the world to save sinners. I so love what Jesus said concerning his own mission, concerning his own purpose in coming into the world. In Luke 19.10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. My friends, when the fullness of the time came, the Almighty God, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, came down and took upon Himself human flesh. He was born of a virgin. He was born under the law. And He came and lived in obedience to the commands of God that we broke. He fulfilled the law that we transgressed. That's why Jesus could say in Matthew 5.17, He said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill the law of God that we broke. He never lied. He never stole. He never blasphemed. He never dishonored His parents. He was perfect in His obedience. Perfect in His submission to the perfect commands of God. That's why in Mark chapter 1, in verse 11, at the baptism of Jesus, the Father speaks audibly from heaven and He says this, You are My beloved Son, in You I am well pleased. Eudikeo, in the Greek, well pleased, pleasing in one sight. He please the Father. Who else can say that concerning themselves? That they fulfilled the law of God. No man, no woman, no child can stand up and say, I have kept the commands. I have submitted. I have believed sufficiently. I have pleased the Father. Certainly not. However, Christ comes, truly God, truly man, and fulfills the law on behalf of sinful men. And then, the glorious heart of the Gospel. One of the core truths of the message of the Gospel is the cross of Jesus Christ. He laid Himself down and died on that cross for His people. He was beat and whipped and spat upon. He was made a public mockery. Even His own disciples fled the scene for fear of their own lives being taken. And upon that cross, those few hours there suffering as the Lamb of God, He bore the wrath of God. He bore the wrath of the Father against sin. Against the sin of the elect. Against the sin of the church. On that cross, Christ took ownership of the people of God, sin. He took ownership of their transgressions, their law breaking. And He bore the wrath of God. He drained the reservoir of the wrath of the Father so that sinners would not die in their sins and would not be lost eternally. That's why Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions, and He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to His own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. And verse 10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief, if He would render Himself as a guilt offering. What is so significant about this passage that I just read off to you is that it was written around 700 years before the Lord Christ came and was born. This is a prophecy which Jesus fulfilled to the uttermost.
And that is why in Luke, excuse me, in John chapter 19, verse 30, the text reads, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished to Telestai. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The wrath of the Father was completely propitiated, completely put away. God could legally dismiss his people's guilt because Christ had borne it. It was gone. It had been taken away. Their justification had been purchased by the blood of the Lamb of God. He shed his blood at that cross to buy his people out of slavery to sin, out of slavery to the fear of death. And after three days in the tomb, the Father rose him up. God the Father manifested His power in raising His Son Jesus from the grave. And the resurrection of Christ shows us publicly that the Father had received Christ's atoning work at the cross as a sufficient payment for the sins of the people of God. That His sacrifice was accepted. See, in the Old Testament, when God instituted animal sacrifices, which ultimately, as we know from the book of Hebrews, could not take away sin. The purpose of that was ultimately to point to the atoning sacrifice that Christ provided as the Lamb of God. And what is so amazing is that in the Old Testament we find this, that if the sacrifices were not done properly according to the way God had commanded, they would not be accepted. We say that in Leviticus 10 with Nadab and Abihu. God did not receive their sacrifice because, or the instance they offered up because it was strange. It was not what God had commanded. It was done improperly and irreverently. And so God, as the text says, a fire came out of the presence of the Lord and engulfed them. And we find in the New Testament that the cross of Jesus Christ is spoken of as an acceptable sacrifice, a pleasing, a fragrant aroma to God, that it, it pleased the Father. And so Christ is alive, and never shall He die again. Death has no power over Him. After 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, He went to the top of the Mount of Olives and ascended ascended bodily into glory. And He sat down at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand of majesty on high. That's why in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of, his, of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ's work is finished. It is finished. He reigns as King, as Lord of the universe. And the call of the Gospel, the call of the Gospel to the lost is that you must repent and believe the Gospel. You must repent and believe the message of life. That's why Jesus said in Mark 1.15, He said, Repent and believe in the Gospel. And that's right at the outset of Jesus' preaching ministry. That is because it was the message from the beginning. The message has always been the same. The call has always been the same. Repent and believe the promises of God. Believe the Gospel of grace. Repentance is a... a a deep-seated conviction concerning one's own sin. You must see your sin as it is, as it is before God. You must be broken over your sin. Weep and wail over your transgressions and flee. Repentance is a, is a deep-seated conviction that one is going to set out to flee from sin. It is turning from sin. But listen, repentance is also realizing that you cannot flee sin apart from the power of Christ. And so it is, it is Christocentric. It is pointing toward Jesus. Repentance is Christ-focused. And that is where belief comes in. Repentance and faith go hand in hand. Belief in the Gospel is an embracing of Christ. It's believing that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He died truly for His people and that He was raised on the third day truly 
that He has done the work of salvation on behalf of the people of God for the glory of God. That He has done all that is necessary for you to be saved. That there need not be one thing added to what Jesus has done. Away with this this lie from the Roman Catholic Church that you have to add to what Jesus did or that some priest has to re-administer Christ's sacrifice through the Mass, through the blasphemy of the Mass. My friends, Christ is the only mediator between God and man. He is the High Priest. You do not need a priest. You do not need a mediator. You need Christ. No man can mediate for you except the man Christ Jesus. For He is not exclusively man. He is truly God and truly man. And therefore, He can stand as mediator between God and man. And belief in the Gospel, as I said, is grabbing hold of the promises of God. It's, it's believing what God has said to be true. And believing it with one's, with one's heart, with, with, with the all of one's being. with all of who one is. And the promise of the Gospel is for all those who repent and believe it, they will be saved from their sins. They will be forgiven of all sin, past, present, and future, because Christ at the cross purchased forgiveness. He purchased their salvation. Salvation is not something that God freely and arbitrarily gives out in the sense that it did not cost God anything. It cost Christ His life. It cost the Son of God such horrific sufferings upon the cross. In fact, He Himself cried out at that cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, the promise of the Gospel is for those who repent and believe it, all their sins will be pardoned. And they will be forgiven by the Father because of the work of the Son and sealed by the Spirit. And not only that, but they will be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. They will be credited with having lived Jesus' life because Christ was credited with having lived theirs. See, that's the exchange. Jesus takes my sin. Jesus takes my filth. And I receive His righteousness as a free gift of grace. I receive His perfect righteousness to my account so that the Father looks at me as if I lived and performed as perfectly as Jesus did. I lived His life because He was looked upon by the Father as if He had lived my life. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 3, he says in verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Gift righteousness, my friends. A free gift of grace. All of grace. All of grace, my friends. All of the unmerited favor and free mercy of God. That's why the prophet Isaiah could write in Isaiah chapter 55, beginning in verse 1, the prophet writes, Ho! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to to the faithful mercy shown to David. 
Verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the righteous man His thoughts. Or excuse me, the unrighteous man His thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And He will have compassion on Him and to our God. For He will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. All free grace. Listen to that passage. Holy Scripture has been read aloud, my friends. The Scriptures have spoken forth. The text is free. It speaks to the free offer of mercy. So my friends, it is my exhortation to you to believe the message of the cross. And briefly I want to say, for those who genuinely are saved, who genuinely repent and believe the gospel, my friends, Something will happen to them. And here's what will happen. For those who genuinely repent and believe the gospel, they will be changed. Their thoughts, their actions, their, the way they talk, the way they behave, the way they think, will all be changed because they're a new creation. When someone is saved, God gives them a new nature and a new heart with new desires. That's why Jesus said there are many who will say to Him on the day, Lord, Lord. And He will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me who practice lawlessness. Many people who sit in churches are going to go to hell because they were never saved and they do not bear fruit of it. Friends, if you want to know whether you're genuinely converted, look at your life. Look at the way you talk. Look at the way you behave. What are your desires? Are they holy? Do you love the Word of God in prayer? Do you love fellow, uh, fellow Christians? Do you love to share the Gospel with the lost? Do you delight in God's truth? Or is Jesus... Is the idea of Jesus just some side accessory to you? And you just go to church, but you're lost. You're inwardly a ravenous wolf, and you're dead in sin. Such people are greatly to be pitied. I was like this for eight years of my life. Said I was a Christian, but I was lost. Friends, if you don't live for Christ, you're lost. Salvation is not earned by work. However, the evidence of conversion, the evidence of salvation is that the sinner, or the now redeemed sinner, the saint, they will walk in obedience to Christ out of gratitude to God. Out of gratitude. Friends, if you're not living for Christ, it's because Christ is not in you. And I say that out of love because I care for you. The one who loves you the most is the one who tells you the most truth. <clears throat> I'd rather wound you with the truth than comfort you with lies, friends. That's why in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, it says, By this we know that we have come to know Him. If we can keep His commandments, the one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His Word in Him, the love of God, has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him on Himself to walk in the same manner as He walked. The evidence of conversion, the evidence of regeneration wrought by the Spirit of God is fruit. So if the fruit is bad, it is because the tree is bad. And if the fruit is good, it is because the tree is good and the soul has been regenerate. And so if you find yourself as a lost hypocrite, I encourage you to flee to Christ today and be saved. And if you look at yourself and you see, wow, I'm a genuine Christian. I'm a genuine, con genuinely converted soul. Hi. Hi, Miss Carrie. If you find yourself bearing fruit because you're genuinely regenerate, then rejoice, for your name is written in heaven. It's all a free grace, my friends. All of grace. 
And this gospel is not only for the salvation of the lost, but it is for the Christian to feed upon as their daily bread. It is for the Christian to encourage the soul of the believer, to encourage those who have been genuinely saved by the grace of God. The gospel is for us, brethren. I encourage you to rest in it today and then to go and actively, strongly, zealously, passionately preach it. Share it with those who are lost. Proclaim the message of the cross to this lost, perverted, dying world. For souls need to be won to the kingdom. Our king reigns and we ought to win more bond slaves to be co-laborers with us in the kingdom. All of free grace. All grace. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith. My friends, it's all by the unmerited favor of God. Hallelujah! To God! To God be the glory! Glory to God in the highest! Amen and amen. All free grace. And it is all for the glory of God. Salvation is so ordered to be all of the free grace of God so that God gets all the glory and all the, all the praise and all the honor. So that God gets every ounce of exaltation. Salvation is to the glory of God. And not only salvation, but all things, all things are redounding to the glory of God. All things are working to that glorious end. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, the Triune God, the Holy One of Israel. He is working all things for His glory. And you would do well to bring Him glory. We all ought to bring God glory for all of who He is and all of what He has done. That's why Paul later wrote in, in Romans 11, in verse 33, this is what is called the doxology of Paul. Specifically here in Romans 11. He says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. To God be glory and praise and honor. To the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, be all glory and praise forever indeed. Amen. My friends, you lost souls, flee your sin. Repent and believe on Christ. And you who are religious, I encourage you to examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith, to see whether you've genuinely, truly been saved. And if you see that you live for Christ and that you're genuinely converted, walk in the truth, walk in holiness and share the gospel with the lost. And if you see that you bear not fruit of conversion and that you're lost, repent truly on today for the first time unto salvation. And my fellow brethren, my fellow saints, be blessed, be encouraged today by the message of the cross. Give glory to God. Rejoice. Sing praises unto His name. Let all the earth worship the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, that God is just in inflicting wrath upon the wicked. God is just in His dealings with the wicked. And we have considered from other texts that God is holy and He's given His law, a reflection of His character. We've broken that law and we deserve hell for our sins. But Jesus came to save sinners and died upon the cross, satisfied the wrath of God, and was raised unto life on the third day. And all who repent and believe on Him will be saved from their sins by His grace and for His glory. To Jesus Christ be all glory and praise and honor in all things forever and ever. Amen.